I was asked if I could take 10 minutes and uh, talk about um, a radical thinker and what is radical about this thought and what I think radicality is or something like this. So I've, I've chosen Spinoza and I'm going to take uh, three or four passages, short ones, uh, from this book, which is uh, his famous one. This is his, his major work, um, the, the Ethics. Uh, let me explain first uh, w why I think Spinoza is a radical thinker and what I'm going to try and support with these quotes very quickly. First of all, you know, the root of uh, radical is, uh, well, it means the root. So to be radical is to go to the root. Um, what's the root? Well, maybe the root is uh, thinking about my own life. Maybe the root is trying to understand myself. Maybe the root is uh, whatever might at, at base incite people to their own activity and their own local change. Uh, and all of these things are addressed very specifically by Spinoza. Um, here's what Spinoza says that I find uh, so radical. You know, Spinoza is, is working on a number of levels. You know, one of the things going on in Spinoza is that he's a part of a, a mystical um, religious tradition, although he's a weird person for that line because he's, he might be super um, spiritualist, but he also might be a materialist. Um, so he's, he's interested in thinking about how through our behavior and our thought we, we might come to experience the continuity of the entire uh, universe and network of causes through ourselves. That's sort of part of the big picture. But he's also an ethical and a political philosopher and these are the things I want to talk about. So an ethical philosopher is one who thinks about, you know, in Aristotle the word ethos, he translates it as related to habit. You know, the kind of habits that compose me. If I, if I care about who I am and what I do, I have to care about how I form myself and the, the behaviors and uh, attitudes in which I regularly engage. So Spinoza is an ethical philosopher and he's also a political philosopher. So in answer to the basic ethical question, uh, or I suppose it's a metaphysical question, what am I? Spinoza answers, well, I am desire. I am a tendency to exist and to expand the power of my existence. So to exist is to have the capacity to produce effects. And the more I exist, the more effects I can produce. So it's, it's, always, a, it's always and already a philosophy of, of power in Spinoza. So I am desire. What should I do with my life? Here is the properly ethical question. And the Spinozist answer is, I should, with my life, seek to expand my power. If I am, to begin with, nothing but a tendency to exist, and a tendency to exist more, then the decisions that I make about how to live my life ought to be rooted in this particular desire. What should I do? I should make myself more powerful. Now, um, Spinoza maybe I should have said, Spinoza was a, a Portuguese Jewish Dutch philosopher writing in the late 1600s. Uh, the generation before him, I think his parents um, were pushed out of Portugal by the Catholic Church, which wanted nothing to do with non-Christians, and Holland was a welcoming place for refugees of that kind, which is maybe in certain ways, um, you know, ironic because Holland was at that same time uh, involved in very deeply in the slave trade and in its own colonialism. So welcoming on one hand and nefarious on the other. But this is where um, Spinoza finds himself. And it's also a place where certain experiments in democracy uh, were taking place. Um, now this, this doctrine which says I ought to do whatever I can to increase my power could also be phrased, well, I ought always to seek my own advantage. And that kind of philosophy sounds like it could very well be individualistic and even potentially commensurate with like uh, a capitalistic um, life path. Uh, and that would, I mean, I don't put it past Spinoza that like he could be infected and inflected by that sort of thing because, you know, if you know something about uh, European and colonial history, Holland is one of the key places that uh, capitalism was developed early, early on. But it seems to me that 
Spinoza's philosophy ends up not being individualistic. And this is, this is the second aspect of his radicality, which I hope to show to you. Um, that is that though we are often told that the individual and society are at odds with one another, and I could either be like a social individual, and then I would be doing altruistic stuff and helping people out to my own detriment, even though it's good for me in the long run and I might go to heaven and whatever, um, or I can pursue my own interests, but this probably means that I will be stepping on others. We often have individual in individualism and uh, communal spirit opposed to one another, but in Spinoza they're the same thing. If I actually care to advance myself in such a fashion that I increase my power, and power always means the range of things which I am capable of, and uh, at the same time the range of thoughts or thinking that I am capable of having, they always change because in Spinoza the body and the mind are really the same thing. Uh, if, if that's really my goal, I'm going to find out eventually that in order to expand my power, that is the number of things of which I am capable or the number of effects which I am capable of uh, producing, I'm going to have to join together with other people in order to do this. So in Spinoza's philosophy, my self-interest is not at all at odds with communal interest. In fact, the best thing that I can do is to cultivate myself as the sort of person who can form real and lasting bonds with others. Specifically, I, I should cultivate the specific virtues of uh, you know, friendship and honesty, the things that are necessary in order to bind me together with, with others. Because only in binding together with others will my own power actually develop as well. Uh, and, you know, the more I'm bound together with more people and we're operating in a shared interest, the more my own power has grown. These, to me, are, are radical thoughts. Okay, so let me read you a few passages in order to support uh, this reading I have of, of what Spinoza's up to. Uh, so this is the ethics. The ethics is uh, laid out um, on the model of a, a geometrical proof. So these are propositions. Um, it's, it's broken into five books, and each book is a series of propositions, which propositions are followed by um, sometimes so-called scolia, which are sort of like explanations or another way of putting it, uh, or corollaries. Uh, so it's extremely formal, and it's really hard to read. Um, but I've been reading it for 25 years or so, over and over, because I find all kinds of interesting stuff in it. Even though, you know, in a lot of ways it's a book about God. I don't even believe in God, and there's lots of people who don't believe in God, but who are still extremely moved by Spinoza. In Spinoza, God is the same thing as nature. He always says, God sive nature, which is the Latin for, like, or. You know, it could be this or it could be this, and they're the same thing. Anyway, okay, so uh, book one, Proposition 11. Uh, this is a section about uh, proving the existence of God, but I'll, I'll just choose one sentence here. To be able to exist... Or sorry, to be able to not exist is weakness. On the other hand, to be able to exist is power, as is self-evident. Um, existence and power are the same thing. And then later he'll go on and he'll tell us that uh, power consists in the ability to produce effects. Okay, so then let me move on to uh, part four. Uh, by the way, the first part of the book, if you're interested, the, it starts off super abstract. It's really hard to follow. Uh, and it's about God, and he starts by proving the existence of God slash nature. And if you realize it's about nature, there's something like really weird and interesting going on there, because who would need to prove the existence of nature? Which is sort of how Spinoza thinks about it. Um, but then the latter part of the book is, is all about like the experience of individuals, the experience of humans, and what would be the best course for us to follow. Okay, so uh, in book four... Uh, proposition 24. Now we're describing what virtue is. So virtue, this term virtue, uh, comes from, uh, well, ultimately that's, that's the Latin term, which historically has been thought to be equivalent to the Greek term arete, and arete means like excellence, but it means excellence of function. Uh, so in Aristotle's ethics, the goal is to find out what's the appropriate function of humans, which resides for Aristotle as for Spinoza in rationality. And then how do you perfect that? Um, 
So virtue is the perfection of the individual. Uh, Ethics 4, Proposition 24 says, To act in absolute conformity with virtue is nothing else in us but to act, to live, to preserve one's own being, these three mean the same, under the guidance of reason, on the basis of seeking one's own advantage. So for me to be a good person and for me to pursue my own power are the same thing. In this respect, it's a selfish philosophy. And it's definitely not like a Christian philosophy, which says, okay, whatever your desire is, you need to really clamp down on that if you want to be a good person, because it's going to lead you astray into the devil and all that kind of stuff. There's no such thing in Spinoza. And if Spinoza believes in God, he certainly does not believe in a devil. And God is the same thing as nature, right? It's not some bearded fellow up in the sky. Now, this is actually uh, book four, proposition 35, corollary two. It is when every man is most devoted to seeking his own advantage that men are of most advantage to one another. Now, that's contrary to how people most think, right? Like, mostly think. Like, if I'm pursuing my own advantage, I'm not pursuing yours. But the claim here is that if I really know what's good for me, which is uh, understanding the world that I'm a part of, truly expanding my capacity to act and to understand, which are going to happen at the same time. Um, If I know what's really good for me, what's good for me is also good for you. It is when every man is most devoted to seeking his own advantage that men are of most advantage to one another. For the more every man seeks his own advantage and endeavors to preserve himself, the more he is endowed with virtue, or the greater the power with which he is endowed for acting according to the laws of his own nature, that is, for living by the guidance of reason. But it is when when men live by the guidance of reason that they most agree in nature. Therefore, it is when each is most devoted to seeking his own advantage that men are of most advantage to one another. And then you get a kind of simpler uh, reading down here at the bottom uh, in the scolium. Men will still discover from experience that they can much more easily meet their needs by mutual help and can ward off ever-threatening perils only by joining forces. Not to mention that it is a much more excellent thing and worthy of our knowledge to study the deeds of men, blah, blah, blah. So I get stronger by working together with others. Okay, and then lastly, uh, book four, proposition 38... That which so disposes the human body that it can be affected in more ways, or which renders it capable of affecting external bodies in more ways, is advantageous to man, and proportionately more advantageous as the body is there, thereby rendered more capable of be, being affected in more ways and of affecting other bodies in more ways. On the other hand, that which renders the body less capable is in this respect harmful. Um, so... The more I'm changed so that I can produce more effects in the world, the better off I am. The more physical things I'm able to do, like practical stuff, the more I'm able to think. The more I'm able to think, the more physical stuff I'll be able to change. But all of these endeavors, which are like what is core to my nature, uh, this is what I should really be doing, this is about affirming myself as existence, All of the things that I need in my life to make me stronger, I also need others for. Because I can only think so far by myself. I am subject to prejudices. I am subject to uh, mistakes. I am ignorant of many things. All of my experience is perspectival. If I speak with you, then my understanding gets better. If my understanding gets better, my capacity to act gets better. I need to be together with you and I need you to speak truthfully to me. And we need to respect one another and and speak respectfully to one another. We need to cultivate friendship so that I can think better. And then, of course, this is also true on on a practical level. In order to increase my existence... And to me, this is, you know, doubly important. Spinoza also did not believe in an afterlife. He thought that was like fiction and, you know, fairy tales and stuff. I don't believe in an afterlife. I don't believe in a god either. Uh... If this is the only life that I've got, well, what better to do with it than to make it as powerful as possible? I would rather not just exist as some kind of like, you know, um, couch potato who watches TV and then goes to work and does what he's told. It's like, in that case, I barely exist at all. 
I may be able to change the world insofar as I modify some spreadsheets that are going to satisfy my boss, but beyond that I have not changed shit. Uh, wouldn't it be better if I was capable of changing what work was like? If I was capable of changing like what my everyday life was like? If I was capable of changing the world, to, at least to some minor extent, in which my child is going to live? All of these things that I, I think it's sensible and reasonable to do, I do better insofar as I'm connected with others. And only with others, in truth. And this is one of the ways, you know, here's another person that liked Spinoza, Marx. Um, only by combining my forces with others am I ever going to be capable of really doing what my existence requires of me which is amplify my power. I can only amplify my power. I can only change the world. I can only alter things. I can only be, which in Spinoza, being and being causal are the same thing. I can only be a cause insofar as I nurture my own powers, and I can only nurture my own powers insofar as I join together with others. We can only change the world by working together. And therefore, one of the key radical things in Spinoza, I suppose, is, is his idea of friendship. It's not the case that by making myself stronger and better, I have to get at a distance from you or, or, or step on you. No, it's, it's the opposite. A sensible person is, is a real friend to any and everybody who can see that they're a, a real friend, who is also themselves capable of being a friend. Because these friends, uh, are greater than the sum of their parts. And insofar as they're capable of working together, they improve one another. Now, this is also Spinoza riffing on Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. You can find a very similar model of the friend in the, in the Nicomachean Ethics, where each friend is looking at the activity of the other, and they're helping the other to see and understand their activity in such a fashion as to be able to Im improve it. So, you know, one of my favorite contemporary uh, sets of writers is uh, this group called the Invisible Committee, and one of the the key sections from uh, their first book, which is called The Coming Insurrection, is, you know, it, the, at least the statement at the beginning says something like, never forget the political dimension of friendship. I tend to think that uh, pursuing my own advantage and recognizing that my advantage and friendship are, are corollaries, they go together rather than being opposite, these are politically powerful starting points.